Hi, Ooh, there's mm-hmm. Hey, Tanya Justin's in the house. I'm also going to, uh, all right, well, I wait for you to admin me, co-host me. There you go. There we go. And then I will in turn co-host Tanya if you haven't done that yet. Let's see, are we hearing her? I am here. I'm just. Oh, there we go. I hear you. All right. Well, I know you're going to step out in a little bit, Justin. So uh, you've been sending out a few emails. So maybe just before you go, uh, maybe if you can just sort of situate the conversation today. Um, If there's anything that you've noticed that's of interest, Tanya and I are going to take it away just for uh, a random chat. Um, For those of you that are in the the forum here, first of all, welcome. Justin has initiated the recording. And this is really just a bit of an opportunity to kind of connect and get a bit of a sense on some of the things that you might be facing within your organizations as the ongoing trajectory to online learning continues to unfold. Um, And uh, beyond that, just to get a better sense of what you're up against, other the, these sessions sometimes run 20, 30 minutes. It's rare that they run the full hour unless we have everybody yipping away. But we'll just pause here, Justin. Maybe you can launch us into it. Anything you've noticed in the forums and then get out. No, um, it's been great to see some people already starting to move through. Um, as you know, this course, it's a self-paced uh, one. The, the last one that we offered was instructor paced. So um, we offered a, a number of different live sessions. But we, want, we felt it was important to, to be able to still have an opportunity for you to communicate with us, especially as we're preparing for um, the next term, um, whether it's your fall or your spring, um, and the opportunity to, to ask any questions, bounce ideas off of uh, us and other people in the session. We definitely encourage, um, again, this is as, as a self-paced course, uh, for, for people to help support each other as well throughout, throughout this. Um, so you know, we'll offer any expertise that we have in our sessions um, we will have four live sessions that we're going to do here through July um, and al- alternating between sort of what would be U.S. Central Time early morning and, and late, af- uh, late afternoon, early evening time for us just to make sure we can cover, you know, the global audience, um, trying to make sure that we, we can do the, the best we can with that and with the sometimes challenges with, with synchronous in, in, a, in a global setting. But, um, you know, if you uh, can't make a session, no worries. We'll definitely record them and I'll get them transcribed and put into the course. And, um, you know, it's been great to see some of the conversations that have taken place. Um, we definitely encourage you to engage with others as, as much as you feel comfortable in doing so. And um, we're super excited that you are a part of this. And, um, you know, if you have any questions, um, we can ask them up front. Um, feel, free to, feel free to chime in and, and be part of the conversations as well. Um, we'll at least have two of the course instructors in each of these sessions. So um, we have Matt will sometimes pop in. Um, we'll have Megan as well as as Tanya and George and myself. So um, again, thank you for coming. And um, I said, we'll we'll always have some sort of topics and um, some trends and things that we're seeing uh, coming up. So we'll always at least have something to talk about in case everybody's kind of quiet. But again, feel free to engage and we'd love to learn more about you and how we can help you out. Great, uh, thanks, Justin. And uh, as I mentioned, whenever you wanna sort of step out, uh, you know, good riddance. So uh, first of all, I just want to introduce Tanya. Um, so uh, because uh, her and I are going to sort of have a bit of a chat here on uh, random things going on in the state of the world, uh, at least as it relates to digital learning and online learning. Uh, all of you have likely seen Tanya's either videos or uh, access some of the resources that she's shared in the, the course site as well. And so we, I assume that your, your, most of you will have a good degree of familiarity with, with uh, her thinking and her work and her research. Uh, I've known Tanya for, I'm not even sure, it's probably got to be like 15 years or so, and uh, had a few opportunities to chat with her out at her institute in, uh, in University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. And so it's always a pleasure to be able to engage in a project uh, together with Tanya. So, Tanya. Hey, quick intro, if you don't mind, beyond the little butchering that I did. Um, Hi, I'm Tanya. As George just mentioned, I'm at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. Um, I am from the field of communication, which I study communication technology and sort of just started thinking about how I could teach with technology since that's sort of what um, my area was and ended up um, just rolling into all of this. So figuring out how to use technology in teaching, helping other people um, use technology in the course. A lot of what everybody in this course is right now trying to figure out how can we use it most effectively. 
And, you know, a lot of that through the years, we started conducting research. Um, fast forward, I launched a National Research Center a few years ago. And so we've been able to do a better job of sort of identifying, you know, what actually influences student outcomes and, and those sorts of things. So um, in response to the pandemic, George thought um, about putting this together and invited me along for the ride. <laughs> and so um, that is sort of what I'm doing here <laughs> in summary. And, and I should mention that the same institute that Tanya received funding for that she was successful in, we put in a failed submission out of UTA. So there is some lingering negativity, which is why sometimes uh, we send her like pineapple and ham pizza uh, just to, to punish her. Anyway, no, it's, if you haven't seen the work that she's done with uh, the, uh, the data site, and I'm sure you have, if you've looked at all in the course, you'll see there's some fantastic work and a really good overview. So one of the things when we started here, and it seems forever, right? I mean, time's just really whack these days. It feels like we've been in this purgatory space of digital learning and COVID and, and increasingly social unrest forever. But when you look at where we started with this, Tanya, it was literally, you know, a few months ago where we were like, oh, hey, there's a lot of academics that are going to be moving their curriculum online. And there's probably benefit in us having a little bit of support. And by support, we just meant introducing them to the literature. We have no sort of product to sell or anything. We were just trying to say there are a number of challenges that educators need to be aware of, but they should also know that it's not... Uh, a hopeless landscape, meaning that there's an awful lot of resources and an awful lot of literature that's uh, and research that's already been conducted in this space that can help guide educators. So if you look back at low those many months ago, Tanya, what do you what do you see different now in the conversation around digital learning and onlining than what we did back in March? Um, well, I think probably two things come to mind. Well, the first thing that comes to mind, this is not one of the two, but how was that way back in March? Because for in some ways, that definitely feels like that was yesterday. It's hard to believe it was that many months ago when we um, sort of started on this new voyage here. Uh, I think the first thing that's really exciting that I'm seeing is that people are understanding that the the choice to online is not just to replicate face-to-face, -face, which some of us who have been doing this for a couple of decades knew. So the answer isn't necessarily like this, just you know, open a Zoom and do your whole class this way. So I think quickly people were able to identify the challenges with that and were actively seeking out alternatives to just having these synchronous sessions um, for all of the reasons why they can be a disadvantage. So I think that's really exciting to see. One of the things that is a little disappointing to see as I just sat in like a research board meeting the other day is somebody was just asking me, um, you know, how long should lectures be now? I know lectures are online or different. How many ex exact minutes am I supposed to be lecturing online? My colleagues and I um, need to know this uh, and there's no research on this. This was like several leaders um in education talking about that there was no research on how to teach online so i think there is still a significant amount of people that don't understand that through the past um, couple decades few decades probably more that we've identified through research what actually works and what doesn't work and what's actually going to have a positive impact on students and and all of those sorts of things yeah, that's, and I, I find that that conversation is so much more nuanced. I think within the educational technology field, you know, those people who've been involved in distance education and in online learning for a large period of time, um, you're aware of a number of the difficulties that exist in, and the nuance of the work. So we, there are models that talk about, you know, a sense of teacher presence, the community of inquiry model that we use in this course. So the idea of a lecture as a type of a teacher presence, but it doesn't need to be that. I mean, there's synchronous and asynchronous. There's different medium approaches that you can use for communicating the same idea. Some learning outcomes are better suited toward hands-on doing, if you will, and others are better suited towards social interaction and discussion. And so I found it interesting to see was 
really, first of all, you know, no one really wanted to go, or a good chunk of people did not want to go online uh, in, in the manner that they did. It's certainly not a desirable approach because developing a course often can take months, if not longer, because you want to be able to articulate your outcomes. You want to plan your learning related activities. You want to get the balance of media right. There are accessibility issues that you need to consider for the diversity of your population. There's a range of cultural factors that you need to be aware of and so on. So moving a course online is uh, akin to uh, a colleague that uh, Kelvin Bentley, there's a video that you'll experience later in the course with him. And he was moving from Florida to Austin, right in the middle of the the COVID cycle, and and he said it's it's not unlike that experience. It's your you you know you've got your house here with all your stuff organized. Now all of a sudden you have an opportunity to move to a different state. Well, there's so much you have to do, and some of it's just administrative and routine, but all of it is disorienting. You know you got to update your driver's license, and you got to uh, you know find the new neighborhood, the new this that, the other thing. Your routines are all disrupted, and so on. I think in a lot of ways that's exactly what the online experience is when it's kind of foisted on you but I just want to emphasize that there is a terrific degree of research that's available for um, researchers that are interested or not researchers academics who are interested in moving into this environment and one of the things we were hoping to do with our uh, current course was to provide some guidance on that knowing that it is a taxing process but also knowing that many people were sort of thrown at it aggressively. And we started off during the course, the first run of the course saying, there's a two hump problem, right? The first cycle is make it through till May, till the semester ends, then you'll have a little extra time to plan and deploy. But even now, you know, at UTA, for example, there's a range of uh, models on either we're going fully online for some courses, hybrid for others, uh, there's the talk of nobody coming to campus after the Thanksgiving break or coming back and, you know, so on and so on. So there's the pieces are still up in the air. And yet the research around high presence, high engagement, ongoing support is still pretty consistent across regardless of the modality that you're considering. I think um, so this week was um, a conference called the Online Learning Consortium Innovate Conference. And um, Martin Weller, um, who is a, a friend of ours and George interviewed as one of the videos that you can watch, was keynoting the event. And it was very interesting. I really liked how he, um, we were asking him questions about how you help students prepare for this fall semester. And, you know, when we think about face to face to online, you know, he had pointed out just the idea of the physicalness and the architecture prepares students to be ready for certain things. So like when you walk into a classroom, um, in some classrooms, in most classrooms, you know, there are a bunch of seats and there's a person at the front and that's just sort of the way it goes. The acoustics are set up, maybe there's a sage, there's stage, a sage probably is on the stage. <laughs> Uh, but there's all these sort of characteristics of that physical setting that we are sort of all known for years and years that gets us prepared for that. And then students go to the library and they know that's where they interact and do those sorts of activities. And when we move online, I think for us as um, faculty and instructors and for students, there isn't that piece of it of sort of what do we do? And I think there's also the, is this really gonna work when we move it online? Because a lot of times we can't take what we were doing face to face and move it online. So it's not just about walking in a room and talking and knowledge happens, um, which sometimes we think of in the face to face. When we're online, as George pointed out, um, which are factors I didn't know um, in great detail. Um, I knew about social presence a little from studying community, computer mediated communication, but I didn't know about engagement. Now I've done all of the research and engagement back to the 1940s, who knew it was that old. Um, but you find out when you're going online that there's these new things that are super important. So developing social presence, um, focusing on engagement. So those are just new things that I noticed when going online that I didn't really know about that are things that now you need to pay attention to the social interaction and the social involvement piece of it is so important. Um, and it doesn't just happen naturally. You're not just in a room that sort of facilitates that where you can just sort of chat. 
And I know too, some of you, um, I know there's a lot of um, discussion happening in the um, first couple of modules. I know a few of you have actually made it all the way through. And some of you have been chatting about the difficulty in having those discussions online or things that you used to do that were a little bit more interactive in the face-to-face, -face, trying to make that happen online. But online discussions, as I learned a long time ago, don't just happen. <laughs> you can't just go to a discussion um, forum area and just say, um, as you'll see in, in, in what we do, um, you can't just say like, hey, let's talk about this, or what do you think about this? Um, you have to structure it, and you have to have a really purposeful prompt um, something for students to reflect on, and there has to be a requirement that all students participate. So it is a challenge to do those, and it does take time to actually structure that um, discussion, but at the same time, it provides an opportunity because you get to hear from everybody, um, not just, you know, the couple extroverts sitting in the front that are probably going to get A's anyways. Um, you get to hear from all of the students, and it's really great to hear those different voices. Yeah, so one of the things we did was we put together a bit of a master bibliography that uh, if you haven't yet, when you logged into to the course, uh, you'll see it listed uh, early on uh, under, uh, well, literally master bibliography. Um, and you'll, it'll give you just a bit of a sense on what are some of the resources that are, are available. So you should see it between your week zero and week one. And that was just there to say, look, this isn't unknown territory. There is an entire discipline that's available that'll help guide you in some of the decisions that you make. One of the mindsets though, and I just want to talk a little bit about mindsets and then maybe we can shift over to, to any questions. So if you have questions that you'd like to ask, please drop them in the forum now. I think Justin actually already recommended that. Uh, one of the mindsets that I've found to be most useful when you begin to move online is really one of uh, exploration, uh, one of patience, and actually one of kindness toward yourself. Uh, and, and so I'll just unpack each of those a little bit. Exploration just says, look, it's a new space. The only way you find and learn about new space is going back to your moving to a new country, city, state metaphor is walk around, find out what's there, try something, try, uh, if you don't use Twitter, which is a Latin term that means hellhole that's destroying humanity, but if you don't use Twitter, then maybe set up a Twitter account. Just try it out for a little bit and see you know, what it's like. Somebody can flame you, your feelings can get hurt, you'll despair for humanity. Then you, you wanna look at somebody says, what's the you know, hypothesis as a, as a system for sort of annotation? And you're like, oh, that's interesting. You kick the tires. What is hypothesis? How does it work? What might be used with it? So set a little bit of time just in your mindset to be able to explore. Just try different things that might make sense to you. You hear something, kick the tires, go on. You, know, you hear TikTok, you set up a TikTok account. Don't do anything particularly embarrassing. Just tr watch a few of the trends. That's, that's literally how you learn. You have to explore the new territory the way you would if it was a physical space. The second aspect, though, is, is really around patience, is that there is such a need to recognize that this is an entire space of practice and research and inquiry. So if you've taught heavily in classrooms up until now, whether it's in a K-12 setting or college or university or even in a corporate environment, be patient with a number of, of experiences that you encounter. You, it's, you need to have new experiences and get comfortable with what that actually entails for you when you're there. And then the other one is kindness, self-compassion. I'm not sure what the word to use is there, but first of all, I promise you, you'll make mistakes. I promise you, you will embarrass yourself. And I promise you that it's happened to other academics. So there is nothing that you're going to do that someone else hasn't done. And so you'll be fine. Like it might not feel like it sometimes. You'll try something, you'll get overwhelmed. There's too many discussions or there's, you said this should happen, but you might've got the date wrong on your syllabus versus the way the calendar is managed in, in your LMS. It can be mundane things like that. It can be big things where you say something or upload a file that was you snuggling on the couch uh, with your puppy and making nom nom noises and you accidentally didn't want that video uploaded to the forum. And so what I'm trying to get at is you're going to embarrass yourself. It's an absolute absolute guarantee. Um, but that, as you need to be compassionate to, to yourself and recognize that you're learning a new space. You're not often doing it because you want to. You're doing it because the world's on fire. 
and um, don't you know try and manage it as best you can and also model a little bit of that for your students because they're going to be equally disjointed or frustrated or upset many of them didn't pay the tuition that they're paying to learn online they expected sort of an on-campus or in-person experience so those are just a few quick thoughts but if you have any questions appreciate that while we're asking questions um, Tanya, I'll throw it over to you. From your end, what are some of the mindset or experiences that you think are, have been important for you to be effective online? Because you've got a terrific online presence and you've been at it for, for 20 years. Yeah, I think the, well, to build off what you were talking about, I was thinking a little bit about, um, there's a scale called openness rigidity. And um, it's an awful scale created in psychology in the 60s, but I used it once on a study and it was just making me think about when you go into something new like online learning, which obviously isn't natural because uh, none of us grew up um, participating, well, necessarily in asynchronous discussion forums um, mixed with academia. And, and so the idea is to be a little bit more open and flexible about how you approach things. So I think that um, if you are tend to be more rigid or stringent on deadlines and those sorts of things, this is not the time anymore. Um, and so I, you know, as I always say, like be forgiving of your students and be forgiving of yourself. I think as we go into the fall, there's a lot of questions about what's that gonna look like. Um, I feel like that should look predominantly online. <laughs> and um, and with that, you know, just uh, working with your students and creating sort of the we mentality is we are in this together and um and we'll figure this out and we're going to try some things um and um you know there's pieces of that where you can actually have sort of ongoing evaluation with your students about you know what worked this week and what didn't work this week and um you know allowing them to have some input and in, in how you're improving things on the fly that's another thing that I've um, learned beyond being openness and um, flexible and forgiving is um, things are going to be changing. So again, sort of back to that rigidity, um, somebody was mentioning in the discussion forums that uh, I think it was Anne, yes, you have to sort of, um, you don't have to, but it works out better if you could sort of get your course set up ahead of time to some degree, get some structure to how it's gonna go and those sorts of things, but also, um, you can change your course on the fly. So if you're trying something for a week or a few weeks and it's not working, try something different. Um, even when we did this at X course, let's say, the first time we did it, we did things one way. Um, certain things didn't work, we got rid of them and we're trying new things. Uh, and, and that was really on the fly in March. Like really, we were piecing that together, I think, every day, as I'm sure many of you were in your experiences. So. Um, so gather, you know, feedback from your students, let them know that their input is valuable and look for ways that you can, um, you know, improve your course as it's going. Um, I wouldn't uh, feel as your, although I know some universities will say your syllabus is a contract, um, you know, I, I, if you just come in this more of this we mentality and, and we can do this and a little bit more flexibility, I think you'll go a longer, uh, longer way there. Um, we had some questions I'm seeing as well. Um, but other mindset things. Um, the other thing I guess I would say is um, mindset always throws me off because I think of the different research on learning. Uh, I think to just go in there and focusing on, um, you know, sort of what I call is the achievement mindset. So, you know, how can you accomplish this and, um, and just, uh, hope to have a good semester. We're going to be in another term. Some of you are probably teaching this summer um, and dealing with that as well. But we're going to be in another term where it's going to be a bit unknown. Uh, we don't know where we're going to be, although I know in the U.S. a lot of campuses are saying we're going to be back on campus, which means there will be maybe some things open, but still a majority of things will be online is what it sounds like. We know there's definitely some financial reasons um, that campuses are um, hoping to open more services up. Um, but we, you know, just need to do our best to get um, to get through the next semester and maybe even the spring semester. 
um, as um, you know, we heard from some national experts yesterday that you know a vaccine might not be coming until 2021. And I think we were sort of throwing that around in the beginning. So we might be here for a whole nother year and toying with technology. The good thing though that I've seen, and, and George, I don't know if you've seen this as well, is that um, some people are sort of coming around to realizing, which we, I think I was sort of hoping for, that there is a bright side to technology and technology is opening up the door to some possibilities that you might have never ventured into before because you didn't have to, uh, because you were very comfortable in sort of the way you do things. And so I'm glad to hear that some of you are venturing into um, new technologies. George, are you hearing similar things? Yeah, that's a really good point. I just, uh, so yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the fact that knowing that this isn't a blip, and we said this early on, if this runs for three weeks, it'll be, it won't have an impact. Uh, I'm 100% convinced that higher education is irrevocably altered as a consequence of COVID. Uh, it, it, even if we do get back to campus-ish by fall, early 2021, at minimum, there's a huge range of academics that now have a new tool set, uh, a new set of expectations at, you know, for what is possible. And at minimum, there'll be more technology use in education. And, I'll, and as something I've said previously, we will also see, you know, my interest is often you know, motivated over the last while within the learning analytics field. But I think we're also setting the foundation for a massive thrust of uh, new uh, projects that relate to research on the data that is generated as students learn and the related ethical criteria that that produces. Um, so here's a question I just want to direct that, that came out of the forum. Tanya, you might have read it already, but it was around. By the way, I should mention, Tanya just mentioned this you know, early on, like we did things differently. So when we ran this course last time, we actually, you might not be familiar with Zoom bombing, but we had one of these sessions where we had a group of, I think, 50 or 60 students. I have no idea how many it was. And then a group of people. So Zoom bombing is people show up and just scream and yell racist slurs and share their video and have, you know, pornography fear or whatever else in the middle of a class. So we've been teaching online for a long time and that was the first time I had that particular unique experience. So what I'm trying to get at is Tanya and I and others are having the same cycle of newness that you all are going to experience when you're going through it. And you know, we've been at this for a certain period of time that you, you'd think that you wouldn't have those kinds of experiences and yet you still do. So a really big point of guidance that Tanya touched on was when you're running your course, listen to your students. What's working for them? What's not working for them? Because they're going to give you some good guidance that you can incorporate and ask them for solutions too. If they say this isn't working, a simple question is, well, what would make this more effective for you? Like how, how could we make this? And they'll have good suggestions often, or at least be able to recognize that you're willing to listen to what they have to say. Adam's question was around uh, technologies that have been used to assist students with various disabilities uh, regarding online learning. And this is a huge area of interest that uh, has actually got a long profile in distance and online education. And recently the tool of Blackboard, I think it's Ally, that uh, Blackboard has that makes it available to do some assessment of how friendly is your curriculum to people with various disabilities. There's a lot of interest around vision impaired or hearing impaired. You'll find that our videos are typically transcribed, that the, uh, the speech to, to text options that are increasingly becoming very sophisticated. I was looking at a, another MOOC I was taking on Coursera that looked at an Amazon platform called Poly, where they said it's so expensive to update your curriculum all the time because recording takes time. So they actually use Poly to be able to do that, which is just a, a, an automatic text to voice transcription service and so on. So what I'm trying to get at is there's a number of technologies that are making the online experience more effective. I don't have tremendous experience in a range of these technologies other than the standard, make sure that you're hitting the right compliance expectations within the university and Ally and Blackboard and other platforms. But Tanya, anything you want to share beyond that? Yeah, I think there's um, so uh, there's some different efforts in um, in post secondary education, and I've noticed this time around we have a lot of folks in K twelve, and we can get to some of those questions as well. 
Um, but there's just some basic instructional design practices that we've learned over the years and that we share that just make the content accessible for everyone. So for example, um, putting videos up or having lots of synchronous sessions, um, those should always be captioned. But um, so like in the beginning, we did more of the lecture type things or content delivery were asynchronous. And we actually wrote out transcripts for some of those back when we didn't even couldn't really like make video happen in learning management systems. The majority of learning management systems do have, um, they are 503B compliant um, and do have the different features with accessibility. But the thing about, you know, when you think about captioning something, um, when you, when I talk with students and I've done some research about content delivery, the thing about videos is, um, if I'm going to talk about something for a half hour or an hour, it takes a half hour or an hour for them to listen to. If I just write it up, um, then they can read it much faster than they can listen to it. And they love annotating it. And we know from our research that annotating text actually increases um, learning and students are actually more satisfied with that. So. There are little tips that you can learn. Um, there's something called the universal design of learning. Um, I was trying to pull up some of the other resources, the national organizations that focus on instructional design and accessibility and the hashtag. I think there's an ally hashtag. Um, I know um, my colleague Kate at the Michigan State University does a lot of work in that area. So um, sometimes using like the cool or uh, more video captioning and, and those sorts of things are not necessarily, not just accessible to folks who potentially are um, hard of hearing, deaf or hard of hearing, but also could be um, hindering just all learners, you know, that maybe um, need um, it in text as well as media. So I tend to try to share things in multiple formats when possible. Um, the other thing for us in the U.S. in post-secondary ed is um, a student has to opt in for um, accessibility, which actually becomes easier with some online things. So doubling the time on exams and those sorts of things make it a lot easier. I tend to have multiple learning activities for the same learning objectives anyways, just to provide my students some variety and knowing that multiple things work. And, and that's just another thing to be thinking about when you're going online is um, designing multiple activities because what might work for one student might not work for another. And so accessibility um, goes beyond impairment and, and disability. And I, I just want to mention one other thing about research that we've been doing um, at the Data Research Center on students with impairments and disabilities. There's a huge amount of students um, like I wanna say, when we asked students if they had a disability, I don't know, let's say 15% opted in. And when we developed um, a new instrument in partnership um, with our occupational science folks, we ended up finding out like 40% of the students completing the survey had an impairment or disability that they didn't even know. Like if they, you asked them the question, if you have a disability or impairment, they would have never even noted it. So there's a huge uh, percentage of our students that are dealing with impairments or disabilities um, that may seem a little bit transparent to even themselves. So just think about those things when you're designing, you know, does this work for everyone? And I think that goes back to another question in the chat too about access. Um, so uh, we thought, you know, the digital divide is sort of gone. Everybody's got internet and a device to do their online learning. Uh, and what we ended up finding out is that, um, you know, where some of the national studies and studies we've done at our own campus would say it's about an issue with about 5% of our students. We're seeing more now that it's an issue with about 20 to 30% of our students um, don't have a space to do their homework, don't have um, a reliable internet access and or don't have a device. So access is definitely an issue. So having synchronous sessions with richer media tends to be riskier is what I call it. Um, so sometimes just think about that too when you're designing courses. Um, you know, the time and day that you might wanna have a course might not seem um, like a big deal, but you know, if you have students in certain home environments, as we know now, lots of uh, people are um, all still in the house at once, kids and adults and grandparents and all that sort of thing. 
So you just have to be thinking about all of, uh, of those factors that sometimes we, those of us I know who have been teaching online for a while sort of thought weren't as much of an issue, but they definitely are. So, um, so I think accessibility um, is a big one and I think it moves beyond um, you know, accessibility for folks with disabilities to accessibility for everybody because everybody has um, different uh, approaches to learning in an online medium and they have uh, different things that they're, uh, challenges they're trying to overcome with access in general. Thanks, Tanya. And, and I'd also encourage people to consider sort of the simple tools that are available. Like for example, if you need to do transcription service, I use a tool uh, called otter.ai and it's just you upload an audio file and it will provide a transcription of that audio file. So, you, or a video file where you've got an, you know, a session like this is readily transcribed using a system like Otter. It's not 100% accurate, but it just makes it a little bit easier. Just like the speech to text, text to speech translation, uh, translation services are much more effective than they were even a few years ago. Um, now, there's another question here around uh, biology and the uh, specifically rigor in an online setting. So the question being raised is, look, teaching a classroom, I know what rigor looks like here, the human contact, you've got a good degree of comfort with it. But then you move this uh, online and it's like, what does rigor look like here? Can you develop the same level of quality in online settings that you can have in a regular uh, classroom environment. And this is really a critical set of questions because there's different dynamics at play in the K-12 system than are in higher education. There are numerous additional dynamics that relate to safety and comfort and autonomy. There's a duty of care relationship that uh, teachers have in K-12 that aren't as prevalent once you get to the higher education sector and so on. So I uh, just want to draw, you know, be clear that there's some distinctions there that are unique based on the ages and the sectors that you're working with. I know Bloom's taxonomy, there's, you know, it's heavily, this, the concept of Bloom's, if not even the explicit statement of Bloom's is reflected in many design practices in higher education or in education in general is what I'm trying to get at. So if you want to move from basic level activities, you know, such as simply the knowledge level up through to more complex synthesis or integration levels, if you will, um, that's doable online as, as just like it is in a classroom. One of the areas that I've found to be most effective and still is central to a lot of online interactions is the discussion forum or in cases where I've asked students to blog and reflect and it because not everybody wants to share their thoughts publicly because they're not comfortable with it but self-reflection sharing a sort of a diary or of experience that they're having and so on that certainly is one way to move people toward you know higher up on the bloom scale if that's the particular framework that they're using um, there's been some criticism around blooms that I don't want to dive into. You could flip it upside down and say the highest level is actually knowledge, whereas, you know, bloom treats it like the lowest level. So I'm going to sidestep that and instead just treat it like a framework that you're using to guide learner activities, moving them from basic to more sophisticated levels of reasoning and interaction with the concept. So if I can abuse the blue model to say that, then absolutely there's a lot that you can do in online settings to move them to higher level thinking. I've found the two best mechanisms without relying on a particular technology is increased socialization in a course, namely students interacting with students, answering their questions. You even saw just a little bit here in the, in the forum where somebody asks a question and somebody comes by and says, hey, we, we use this. That's the kind of self-help or like the help giving behavior that the online medium can enable. The other, so that's one thing is increased socialization. That often requires you as a teacher being more active in prodding and guiding and shaping a conversation. So that means you don't necessarily let a conversation run a free flowing course if it's not moving in the right direction. You drop in, you ask questions, you try and nudge people toward different levels of engagement. The second aspect, so socialization is the first. The second aspect relates to the greater use of self-reflective or uh, sort of think aloud kind of practices that come through blogging and through writing. I'm um, just quickly looking here at me. If, if you want to respond to that, Tanya, feel free. Otherwise, we're going to move down the pipeline here. 
And let's see, Jeanette answered a question. Curious, okay. So I'll just throw Jeanette's out your way. The school said they would try a hybrid online and on-site classrooms because there are significant differences in terms of access to technology. Um, is there something that has uh, been done or will be addressed? Um, I, Jeanette, if I can ask, is that related to this course or is that related to like in general? Because in our course, we do address a little bit the online aspect of it. I see Sanya, uh, Tanya, by the way, uh, has dropped some cast I'm work. I'm typing around her. Okay, no worries. But Jeanette said in this course. Yeah, in this, okay, there we go. So we do, we don't necessarily cover specifically the modality. I think we try and spend our time looking at what does the research say about different kinds of interaction. So good teaching and good learning practices exist outside of a particular medium. Meaning, and there, the research, there's a fair bit of research that's done this, sometimes it's called the no significant difference phenomena, but it's essentially that the design and the quality of the interaction trumps the affordances of a particular medium. So whether you are in person, in dis I mean, a lot of people aren't aware, you know, like Mandela, for example, uh, did uh, education through, through distance education um, years, well, like a century ago almost, uh, the ability to have that kind of an interaction where you can learn even if you have to physically write out your stuff and mail it to a university in London um, uh, versus now there's much more, uh, much richer interaction opportunities with digital technologies. So good design is with the key criteria, not necessarily the particular medium you're using. And so we try to emphasize principles of good design. So the community of inquiry model, I think is effective in a physical classroom, just like it is in an online environment. So the idea of teaching presence and social presence are consistent, I think, in both kinds of settings. Um, and I just want to ask another question. This one I'll throw it to you as well, Tanya, is, um, I think I skipped that one. Someone had said, there's a lot of questions in here. If you were to look, go back, the course was done when we were just at the early stages of the crisis. Uh, what would you have emphasized more if you had done it then versus where you are now? Now, keep in mind, we did revisit and update the, the course and some of the readings and so on. So it's what you're seeing is a bit of a different version than what the first cluster experienced. But is there anything in particular, if you look at from March to now, what have, what have you learned that you think educators should be aware of? What have I learned <laughs> from March till now that educators should be aware of? Yeah, or what would you have done differently designing the course with the experiences you've undergone since then? I never do anything different in my life. Just keep on moving. No. <laughs> um, I don't know. That's a good question. I think we did, you know, did what we could within the time frame. Um, I'm, I don't know. I think a lot of this, you know, I, I've realized recently where I should have a lot of advice and provide more information on research and so forth. Honestly, I think there's a part of me that's like, hey, it's out there, um, feel free to find it. I think a lot of people are just trying to figure out, it's more about what you wanna know, what you're comfortable with and those sorts of things. I think a lot of times in some of my recent conversations, that we find out is maybe the peep, um, which I, that's why I always love the 10 questions activity that I think um, about 50 or 60 of you guys completed in the first um, discussion forum. But I think that's why that's always a good activity because a lot of times you might not be asking the right questions when we're talking about online because you're thinking in um, a framework about a modality. Um, and, and using a pedagogical approach that's been comfortable to you. And so, and a lot of you, and I know for me too, pedagogy was not a word that was in my vocabulary um, necessarily uh, when I started teaching college courses. Uh, and so we have that sort of mirror um, replication piece. I posted a, um, I posted a, um, a link in the, and I've been posting lots of links in the chat room, but there's 
um, Stephanie uh, Moore and some others, Chuck Hodges, put together a piece um, about a little bit about the difference between emergency remote teaching and online learning and some of the no significant difference that George was just referencing. Um, and so um, they're just, um, it's, it's different considerations. Um, I think that the face-to-face, -face, because it's a little bit natural of a infrastructure or structure or architecture that we're used to dealing with, it comes a little bit more naturally to us. And so I think when we're looking at a different architecture, when we're moving online, we need to think about um, how that works a little bit differently. But I don't think I have any great wise um, pieces of knowledge of how we would have um, done things differently. I will, um, I just saw someone talking about flipped. So I'll flip a little and talk about that. Um, one of the things we talk about as you guys make it to the later modules, and I know only a few of you have, um, and the last module, uh, module five, I believe it is, we talk a little bit about blended learning. Um, and I really think blended learning, which is an integration traditionally of online and face-to-face, -face, which I know a lot of you will probably be planning to do in the fall, as there may be some requirements for some face-to-face, -face and or there are certain things like labs or performing arts or different pieces that have a more performance simulation piece to it that you would like to stay in the face-to-face. -face. Um, but blended is, is really amazing. And um, and one of the things that people have been talking about now, again, is more high flex, and we're seeing more word about flipped. And I think we need to, um, and it's an opportunity for everyone to just find out about what is good teaching and learning. And so a lot of the teacher-centered didactic models that we've been using for the last, I don't know how many centuries, we've known for 100 years are not effective. I just was reading Dewey and Piaget and Vygotsky, and about 100 years ago, they told us that we shouldn't be um, just lecturing and talking at our students for large amounts of times. I just was reading up to in the 70s when they were developing learning sciences. Again, education's not my area, so this is all sort of new stuff to me. There was sort of this behavioral approach from psychologists that we would fill students like vessels of knowledge um, by talking at them. And obviously I'm a social scientist and from the field of communication, I think everything happens, uh, communicating, meeting, and you know, those things have to come through some sort of interaction, um, interaction with each other, or interaction with the environment. And so when we go online, um, that's pretty much what the last uh, 100 years has been telling us is that we need to focus on interaction. How do the students interaction with the course site, with the content, the course materials, with us, with each other? And that's just something a little different um, that we've no normally focused on the knowledge piece of it, like we are transmitting knowledge. And this time you need to focus on the interaction piece. And so, um, it's not about what do you necessarily do with your lecture. It's thinking about what interactions are going to lead to your student and producing, um, you know, uh, demonstrable or demonstrable um, learning outcomes. So anyways, that's what, that's all I have to say on that. I'm like, I don't have anything to say, but let me just say some stuff about something that's been on my mind. Yeah. Well, we'll try and we'll try and wrap up here in the next uh, ten minutes or so. Um, there was a question Kathy had had addressed, so I want to move through just a couple of these. But Kathy had said, and this is there's no one thing important thing to note is there's no hard and fast answer on any of these things. It's almost always a function of what's your context, your environment, your students, the subject matter. So Kathy's question is, you're thinking of putting together content delivery, sort of what's that sweet spot for length of time for presentation with a curriculum, in this case, teaching biology? I, I think once again, it's always a function of what's the age level of your students, what, how complex is the curriculum that you're doing, uh, you know, how advanced is it? Uh, what what kind of technologies do you have available? Like, do you, are you, for example, it's easy if let's say you're teaching math, if you have a tablet and Zoom where you can share the whiteboard and draw out formulas if you've got, uh, you, you know, a, an Apple Pencil or whatever Android device you're using. That works really well and it's a good, but it's a type of presentation, but it's more engaged than lecturing at someone. As a rule, 
there is a higher cognitive load when individuals need to do things, but there's also higher dis uh, distractibility and engagement, which somebody mentioned earlier in the forums that you end up engaging in this kind of teaching, but your students drop out quickly because you're just not able to keep them sort of captivated. So there is a relationship between, you don't want to do make students do all work all the time because that's overwhelming and fatiguing. By the same account, you don't want to talk to them all the time because that's equally, uh, it has a different outcome. It is uh, more distractible because there's less engagement and so on. So there's a number of things that you want to try and think about or balance as you're going through it. Yeah. Oh, I was so thinking a little bit on, um, on sort of that thing. I've been hearing more about and meeting some neuroscientists that are um, studying some of this um, in K-12 as well as some in higher ed, but it's sort of this idea that the students interact with you and or what you're demonstrating for them. And um, the neuroscience is studying out of those interactions, like what somebody is seeing or hearing, how does that um, end up becoming a part of their memory? Um, because at the end of the day, we want them to remember these things. So as, as George was mentioning, there's lots of different variables. Um, are you just telling them a story? Is there an emotional component to it? Um, is there imagery associated with it? So for example, we know, um, we know from research like a PowerPoint slide with a bunch of words on it is not very helpful. We know that if there's an image that it's more likely to be put in memory um, because there's a, an image associated with the, uh, with the message. So there's um, lots of little things um, out of there, but there's lots of different variables, you know. So the images matter, the message, you know, what you're communicating matters. We also know that there's sort of a time limit. So usually after about 10 minutes of um, them being uh, students being or learners being told, or even us, if you're talking to me, uh, if I would just be, George is just talking to me for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, I don't know what George is saying anymore. Um, I'm just not, I'm just not hearing or getting it all, even if it's a really, really um, amazing story, which it most likely is not. <laughs> but, or I think it's 12 minutes, right? It's a study they did with Harvard medical students. So, oh, Diana just was talking, design for how people learn. Yeah, there's a, a colleague of mine that was at, um, at San Francisco State who is doing a lot of work on this. Um, Milena, and so she's, uh, so I'm learning about all of this sort of stuff. But yeah, the neuroscientists and the cognitive scientists have actually been doing some, some research on this. Um, and a lot of it is done in game development. That's why we're sort of um, addicted to games in that way. But yeah, so it's hard that there's not just one answer, but um, there's definitely some different tips out there on making things, again, more engaging. So things that you are find more academically and challenge that you're more um, socially involved with. Sorry, George, just wanted to throw those in. Yeah, no worries, that's great. And and we do uh, and have a, a video from one of our- uh, Oh yeah, that's right. Upcoming models where we talk about Dunlosky's work around cognition and learning. Uh, and there's a number of uh, very practical, discrete points of guidance on how to foster and promote uh, engagement and uh, learner involvement. Uh, there's a question that Anne asked, or a statement as much as a question, but is the school wants to make a push for mandatory live lessons. Live lessons are useful, by the way. One of the biggest things that curriculum or structured timetables do is force people into a routine because quite often we don't have the self-discipline to enable those routines on our own. Quite often, it's more of a challenge when we're younger. Some of us struggle with it all our lives. And so the benefit of that schedule is is that so it's there, there is value to the live lecture part as Anne notes but there's the risk that it'll be 30 minutes of lecturing and now again here's a question that relates to the platform that you're using if you're using a system that allows breakout teams and you have an activity again this will also be a function of what's the age group of your students but a good way to break up the intervention process is to move towards a shared brainstorming, right? Where you just literally pause and you ask people to type out a comment in the forum and then they post it. Now, if you have 50 people in a class, it's gonna be a disaster. So you don't wanna do that, but you can break people out into groups of 
say three to five people, if you're using Zoom or some other platform that allows that kind of uh, breakout rooms, you can then task them with an activity that they come back and report to you. As a rule, in the online setting, uh, generally instructional time is quite uh, limited. You should dial it back. I would encourage you, if you're not, take MOOCs, take courses online. Well, I mean, you obviously are if you're here, but look at some of the practices for length across a range of subject matters. Take a course on neuroscience. How long are they running their videos? Uh, and when do you find yourself getting distracted? What's your experience? So be a learner in the environment to understand the experience of the student. But you're absolutely right. There's, uh, it's just too much time to be lecturing for 30 minutes. Breakout rooms, reflection time, asking people literally just to visualize more. If you have a tablet, draw it out. Otherwise, I tell students like you could, I use concept mapping extensively where, where I ask people to kind of how do pieces fit together and so on. There's software that's available. If you don't have software, literally draw it on a piece of paper, take a picture and upload it. So there's a number of ways that you can promote that engagement. Yeah, one of the things that I like using, um, there's a book by um, from Angelo and Cross called Classroom Assessment Techniques. So sometimes it's really great to break things up. Like if you talk about a topic for 10 minutes, um, and then ask um, like a muddiest point, they call them cats, classroom assessment techniques, a muddiest point cat, like, all right, so out of our discussion on, you know, how to deliver lectures, <laughs> what's, the, um, what's the one muddiest point still in your mind? Um, and so if you can break it up with that, it gives students a chance to reflect on what you were just talking about, to actually process it, and then identify for you what is the muddiest point? What out of the last 10 minutes were they not understanding? So it's an assessment of their learning and, and then it's an opportunity for you to improve, um, improve on that. And there's some that are, I like the one where it's like, um, you know, out of what we were just discussing, you know, what's the point that you think is the most disturbing or exciting? Um, it's something about adding adjectives to your question, your prompt that you're asking them to uh, build in a little assessment there that helps them um, better retain that information and put it in their memory bank. And for, for me, I found it leads to really more amazing discussion, you know, because there's that one student that's like, I found it really disturbing, you know, that um, women are more accommodating in conflict styles and organizations or something. And next thing you know, you have a whole new 10 minutes or so to dive deeper in something um, that's really meaningful to students. So I love the Angelo and Cross, and you don't, the book's, um, the book's out there, but you can also just Google Angelo and Cross um, classroom assessment techniques. I think it's already in our resources. And you just integrate those into your discussions, like every 10 minutes or so. It's a great way to do formative assessments sort of on the fly. Um, and uh, it builds, you know, interactivity and engagement and, um, and, in, and increases learning. Good stuff. Great, thanks, Tanya. So we've got a couple of minutes left here. I'm just going to bring in a point that was raised around the concept of uh, assessment and online assessment. We do address this in, in a subsequent module, but uh, for now, the point is, how do you deal with, uh, you know, high school students who generally cheat when you're doing this kind of assessment? Now, there's, again, context matters. So let's say you have a large group of students and you can't do sort of individualized assessments. You can't do staged assessments. I've often found with writing, the best way to ensure people don't cheat is staged assessments, where you get a, a draft and then you get a first version and then you get, you know, and so on. So it's sequential in terms of how it's developed. If it's an online quiz that you're doing, you can do certain things depending on the quality of your test bank, randomized quizzes, tools that allow for browser lockdown, uh, and so on. Now, the reality is that some students will cheat no matter what you do, the vast majority won't. It's always a tough line to walk between do you punish the vast majority who are honest uh, in order to weed out the few that may not be honest. So there's a bit of a trust dynamic that's at play. Um, so I think the module on assessment we'll get into in a little bit, and it's beyond the scope of what we're gonna talk about at least in today's session, but practical advice is the nature of your assessment will determine how much you can actually influence. If it's easy to game, then 
I would ask whether that's really the best type of assessment that you should be doing. By easy to game, I mean, is it quick to cheat? If it's something that requires personal knowledge, personal effort, that'll be much harder to game. So for example, creating a concept map that reflects how you understand a topic is very difficult to game. Staged provision of, of inputs from uh, assignments and essays, very difficult to game as well. A quiz that's done with a series of 30 questions that's being handled online, very easy to game. So I think that's part of what you, you want to ask and your own time and availability is going to be the key thing that'll constrain it. Uh, anything else that you've seen in the questions that we should be addressing, Tanya, before we wrap up today? I was shaking my head no and pasting in. <laughs> so, um, so just so you guys know, I pasted in the classroom assessment techniques from Angela and Cross. So there's a link to those at UCSD or you can um, get the book. I think you could get the book for like $10. I think I have like the 1990s version. Um, I don't believe in paying a lot for books. Um, and uh, Melina's work, uh, Melina and Camper, she's actually works um, for the Facebook Foundation. I can't ever remember the name of it. Um, but she used to be um, at um, Stanford and UCF. So she, this is um, from her Forbes article on nine lessons from brain science. And so, um, and also we were really lucky that I think it was Diana posted some really great links. I also forgot about Barb Oakley. Um, I met her, she's wonderful. She's um, got a book as well about learning. So there's lots of, uh, like George said, and I think a lot of us know, technology is sort of amplifying access issues. It's amplifying social issues. It's amplifying teaching and learning issues. So um, what we're finding out is maybe our teaching and learning isn't so great. Um, and what technology is doing is amplifying that. So I think at the end of the day, we all just sort of need to figure out um, really how do students learn um, and um, how can we, you know, best create those interactions in the online environment and using which tools with which media characteristics are going to make that happen. And so I think that's a, a real key here. And these are going to be recorded and available online. I know for week one or week uh, module one, you guys just had a ton of stuff. Um, loaded on there and so um, but this will be up there as well um, if you guys want to refer back to this thanks George all right thanks Tanya thanks all for uh, joining here I'm gonna ask Justin to follow up if he's still with us around the question that, that Sean had regarding the morning session we've intentionally structured because this isn't just a sort of a, a US uh, centric or North American centric course we have educators from around the world. So we have a number of different time zones. I'm currently in Australia. So it's uh, sitting around 9.30 a.m. over here. And so uh, the sessions when they're held will be recorded. So at least you'll have access and Justin will provide an email update on that as well in terms of when the sessions are. Yeah, um, I mean, I already have right, those times. Absolutely, yeah. So we're just trying to accommodate right. as many as we can <laughs> for the time, so. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, hope you uh, continue uh, interacting in the forums, ask questions where, where you have. We'll try and dive in and, and uh, comment in that regard and appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Tanya, always a pleasure to chat with you. Chat later all.